Tonight, we'll be in Genesis chapter 18. Now, we should be familiar with Genesis. I, I think that probably all of you have read the book of Genesis because that's the book that you usually read when you first think about reading the Bible. That's the first book you go to and you go, I'm going to read the Bible. And then you read Genesis. And when you're done with Genesis, you put it down and never pick it up again. So that's the book that you know everyone starts with. And, and it is a great book, a lot of wonderful stories in there. And we see a lot of God's grace there. <clears throat> but then we get to Leviticus and we're like, okay, that's it. I'm not reading anymore all these laws and rules and regulations. And so uh, it is a, a book of grace and, and I'm loving it as I go through it again. I went through it with the church back in 19... 1994 when we first started this ministry we started this ministry in in uh, 1994 and it was um, January January 1st that we became incorporated as a church a nonprofit ministry in 93 it was around November that we actually found this building and we began having church here and Genesis was the first book that I started when when we uh, opened up the doors on a Wednesday night I believe we were in 1st John uh, when we opened up the doors for Sunday morning so this book uh, brings a lot of memories going through it the second time looking at old notes you know adding to it and seeing what the Lord has done so so grace uh, we need grace don't we we need grace for for everything the, everything that goes on in our life grace which is God's favor upon us uh, Titus said for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to to all men all men God is having grace right now upon all men in the world that includes the church and those outside of the church as Paul puts it in first <clears throat> Corinthians chapter 5 there are those outside of the church those that don't believe there's grace and you know that because before you came to the Lord, you've experienced His grace. He was there saving you from that situation that you found yourself in and, and screamed out loudly, how am I going to get out of this? And then God appears somehow and gets you out of it. Now that's grace, protecting you, your very, your very life. Uh, many times He protected me before I was even a Christian. <clears throat> and I see now why because he knew that I needed salvation and he was giving me glimpses of his grace and his love towards me. Billy Graham said, God's mercy and grace gives me hope for myself and for our world. And when you look at the world today, and it's, it's horrific, and I know we're going through a lot, but God's grace is going to be amazing as we go through it. As we go through it, and I've seen that. I've seen it in South Sudan, a nation that is not great like our nation. Uh, they call us the, the the rising great nation. That's what they call themselves in South Sudan because they believe that that God is working in the foundation of their nation through Christianity, and He's going to bring it up to to the government at one point. <clears throat> Someone said, "Grace is the incredible, undeserved kindness." God shows us all through Jesus Christ. Kindness. Um, favor. It's what God does in our lives. In fact, it makes Him happy to do so. Uh, He's not a God that is judgmental. He's not a God that's looking to hurt people, but to pour grace on. He knows the bigger picture. And he knows what tomorrow brings. And he knows that whatever it is that you're going through right now, he's going to pour grace on you. He'll allow you to go through it. And he'll be there the whole time with you. Because he's going to give you that grace. Here we find God completing what he promised to Abraham, the promise of the seed, which would be the Messiah, who would come into the world and save men from their sins. Again, the ultimate grace is Christ's sacrifice on the cross, but also keeping his word in that when he is about to bring judgment on Sodom, that God promised that he would save the righteous. And he does. He saves righteous Lot from total destruction. In this chapter here in 18, we see basically... Uh, four things the Lord is going to appear to Abraham but in the form of an angel which is interesting <clears throat> that 
angels can take the form of men and speak the language of men. And they appear to Abraham, and one of those angels is actually Jehovah, the Lord, God Almighty. And he will be communicating with him, his heart. And then we see Sarah, who is reproved because when she's reminded of the promise that God gave to her, she laughs thinking that she's, man, way beyond age. Even, even when the Lord first told her, she thought it was silly. But now, even years later, she really thinks it's silly. So she, she laughs and the Lord inquires as to why she's laughing. And then we see the revelation to Abraham that, that Sodom will be destroyed because of the wickedness. Because of the cries of the children and the blood were coming up to the Lord. And then Abraham, uh, we see him here at the end, being a, a, a prayer warrior, a mediator between his nephew Lot and the Lord, who's bringing judgment upon this wicked place. Um, but God's grace and love saves Lot and his family. So let's go ahead and, and look at these verses. It says in verse 1, Then the Lord appeared or manifested himself to Abraham by the terabith tree of Mirah. Uh, which uh, the tree was a spreading tree, a, a grove tree. It was huge. It brought great shade there. And Abraham found comfort there with his family in a tent by that tree. As he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day, it almost sounds like uh, he's just relaxing, enjoying the day. Possibly Sarah just bringing a picnic, you know, and they're having uh, some lamb chops and, 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 you know, and cornbread and whatever else you have with, with lamb chops. And it's neat to, to spend time and just sit at the feet of the Lord. Uh, we need to do that more. We need to sit at the feet of the Lord. He, he loves it when his children come to him. The, the psalmist says he encompasses the praises of his people. He pays attention. He enjoys the conversation. Uh, I love having dinner with my wife. I, I love going out with her and sitting down and having a conversation with her and trying her food and she tries my food and you know and we choose food that's different that we want to try so that we can try two different things at the same time. Though the other night we decided to get the same thing, which was uh, interesting, but we got the sides uh, a little different, you know. But I, I love doing that. I remember one time we were in in um, Balboa Island there. <clears throat> and we went to a restaurant there that just overlooks the Bay Area. And we were having a dinner. And there was this older couple that were behind her. And I could see them from my seat. And they were talking about church. And they were, they were talking about God. And they were talking about a Bible study that she was going to. And how interesting it was, uh, the Bible study and what the, the lady was saying to her. And so they, had, well, they were having this really deep conversation but it was loud enough that we could hear it and of course you know we start eavesdropping because we can hear it and you hear God and you kind of want to wonder what they're talking about and so Virginia's really listening you know she's like shh, 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 you know and I couldn't talk anymore you know but by the time we were done with our food she just kind of went over and started talking with them and sharing with them and apparently apparently uh, she had just started going to a women's bible study and so it was really interesting to her. And so Virginia gave her some, some kind words. And I mean, they were an elderly couple. They had to be in their 70s or, or older even, maybe in their 80s, you know, that old. But the Lord was even working in their lives. And so, you know, when you're, you're having dinner, when you're supping, and you just never know what God will do. Uh, how many of us really spend time with God, uh, prepare a meal with Him in a sense, spiritual meal? You know, sit down, open up your Bible, and just say, Lord, just speak to me. You know, going, go outside in your patio or in your balcony or wherever it is. Find a spot, just open up your Bible and say, Lord, speak to me. You know, He will. He will speak to you. Because God wants you to fervently seek Him. And He says, you'll find me. And when we cry out and we ask, He'll give to us. Because He says, you don't have because you don't ask. But when we fervently, with our hearts like children demand, Lord, I'm not leaving until you speak to me, until you give me some direction, until you give me some insight, or even just some peace. Uh, many a nights with the Lord will change a person. Jesus here <clears throat> tells John to write in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 20, saying, Behold, I stand at the door 
And if any man hear my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and with me. Uh, communion with Christ. You remember in the upper room, Jesus said he took the cup after supper, eating with the disciples. And then Jesus ate with Mary and Martha as they made him supper and Martha served. So Jesus loves to eat. He loves to fellowship, spiritually speaking. He even told the 120 disciples in John chapter 6, you know, most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of my body and drink my blood, you'll have no life in me. And he's talking spiritually because he goes on and, and he says, these are spiritual things I'm sharing with you. And there's a communion with God that we can all have. And we will all be called to eat at what? The marriage supper of the Lamb. When we're in heaven, Revelation 19.9. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we think our weddings are something. You know, wait till we get to heaven. And we enter into that wedding feast. It's going to be awesome. And, and the groom will be arrayed in his white robe. And the bride will be white and ready for the groom. It's going to be an awesome time. But we see that they were under this tree in the heat of the day. And oftentimes during the heat of the day is when you have hard times, right? None of us like the heat of the day unless you're at the beach and there's a nice breeze on shore. But oftentimes heat in the Bible talks about fiery trials, struggles in life, hard times. So often in my walk, I've seen the Lord in, in fresh new ways when there's heat going on in my life, when, when God is bringing pressure and fiery trials uh, into my situations and he forces me to look at it and say, look, it's you and nobody else and you need to stop. And it's just kind of like a, a breaking of a hard-boiled egg, you know, that, that gets thrown into the water and it gets so boiled that all of a sudden it cracks open, you know, and it's tasty when you eat it with some salt this is not surprising after all as we see Shadrach Meshach and even Abednego who were cast into the fiery furnace it's interesting that when I hear people going through fiery trials you know they're always how do I get out of this how do I stop this fiery trial why is it happening to me and inside and once in a while you'll see me it's one of my flaws I kind of laugh a little like huh, you know okay but but it, it's a laugh of God is doing a work in your life he's doing something beautiful and I know you think it's too hard and too difficult but trust in God and so I don't mean to laugh <laughs> when you're going through stuff but it's it's just interesting because I'm taken back by the fact that I know God is working out something in your life and I know it's hard for you to see through the flames and, and the struggle and the pressure, but he is. And oftentimes, they'll come back later on and say, wow, it's amazing what God has done. And, and they're grateful for it. So Abraham lifted his eyes, and there were these three interesting men standing by him, verse 2. And when he saw them, he ran from his tent door to meet these men and bowed himself to the ground. Now, ordinarily, when you see people coming to your campsite you know you go over you introduce yourself to them and they're just normal people but when they're royalty of some sort or have some sort of superior rank to you it was a custom to to uh, advance to them and bow down to them and then lead them on the way to your campsite in fact you could even tap them on the shoulder just to reassure them that they're more than welcome here and these three men are more than superior because God in his infinite ways of revealing himself to men is revealing himself to Abraham. He had earlier spoken to Abraham and also revealed himself in a vision and now he comes with two angels and three in three human forms somehow. I would have loved to have been there. That was one of those stories that you wish you could go back and replay. God in a form of a man there. Um, some have suggested this is a pre-incarnate of Jesus Christ himself. And then angels in the form. It's interesting because um, a friend of mine had an encounter with an angel. Well, let me, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, <clears throat> I kind of like what Abraham did here because he, it says that he what? He ran. He ran to the door. Uh, here's a 90-year-old man running. 
and he's running to greet these these guests of his uh, almost in a sense of devotion meditation worship and praise to them and verse 3 says my lord if i had now found favor in your sight do not pass on by your servant he knew it was god uh, he had that prior encounter with him through the vision and through the voice and now he sees him face to face reminds me of the picture in revelation when we finally will be there in heaven and we will cast all our crowns to him and we'll see him face to face and i believe that we will be on our face for quite a while in worship and praise of him and so abraham just my lord if i found any grace and that's what the word favor means if i found any grace in your sight do not pass by me please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree he says and i will bring a morsel of bread which turns into a feast right let me just bring you a little bit of something then he goes and finds something to kill and then he makes this whole feast for the lord now, that's how exciting it is when you experience the grace of god i like fresh believers that all of a sudden come to know god and, and they know that their sins are forgiven and god has washed them all away and he doesn't remember them no more and god has this whole new life for them because they've lived the life of that struggles and pains and arguments and sin and drinking and drugs and uh uh, hurting, uh, incest, uh, abortion, and all these things that just hurt people in life. And, and you live with all that guilt, and all of a sudden God comes into your life, and he frees you from all that, says, I've forgiven you, and it's just like, wow, I'm a new person. I have a whole new life. There are so many possibilities now i've got god on my side and god can open doors and he can close doors if he wants to i'm in the hands of god what what am i to worry about life is going to be great i'm going to see some great things some miracles with god and, and, and when a fresh new believer is like that it is amazing what god begins to do i've seen it over and over compared to the older believers right oh yeah i know god yeah, once in a while I, I talk to him. Yeah, I, sometimes he puts me through stuff, but, you know, I'll get through it, you know. <laughs> you know that that kind of like, you know, I've been there a long time, been through a lot, so I'm just kind of like, whatever. <laughs> you know? But that fresh, young person, old person that just comes to the Lord and everything is new to them and they see the possibilities. We need to have faith like a child sometimes. But I found favor, Lord. So he turns it into a feast and he says that you may refresh your hearts and after that I may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. And they said, do as you've said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Now Sarah's inside the tent. That's where they were living and there's, there's quarters in that tent. Uh, there was a woman's quarters, a men's quarters and it's kind of divided. So it must have been a pretty big tent there. So runs to Sarah and says, quickly, make ready three measures of fine coal, uh, meal uh, meated with um, uh, cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, uh, probably to find a worthy animal for wealthy guests. And he took the excellent tender and good calf and gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So they probably roasted it whole, cut it up in pieces and made some sort of stew out of it, right? Boiled it, uh, added uh, a lot of butter to it, uh, swimming in butter probably with, with corn and, and so forth and made this beautiful meal for them. And it says in verse 8, So Abraham dismissed his servants and personally took butter and camel's milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood politely by them under the tree as they ate. Interesting that the angels ate in that. It shows that they have that ability to eat. I don't think they ha need, to, need to eat for any reason. They're eternal, but yet they can eat. Um, I like that because I love eating. You know, and if it wasn't for trying to keep the weight off, I would be eating all the time. You know, I, one of my favorite things as a snack is Boston baked beans. I just love Boston baked beans. Just that peanut with the red shell. Oh, I love those things. Of course, I love pizza and, and pretty soon tacos and, you know, just all that. So it's 
encouraging to know when I get to heaven, I will be eating, but I won't get get overweight, you know. I'm going to be in perfect shape for the Lord and not have any reason to not eat, but enjoy everything that's up there. It's a feast, he said, right? A table that's set before all of it, a wedding feast. So that that is going to be awesome. Awesome. And Abraham eventually, event, evidently fed them before he was aware of their real characters as visitors um, and so forth. Um, Reminds me again, Hebrews says, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing uh, so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. And so now he's entertaining angels without knowing about it. A friend of mine years ago <clears throat> was on the freeway, and his vehicle overheated, so he got out of the car. And one of the, one of the first things they tell you not to do when a car is overheated is to open up the radio cap, right? Why is that? Because the water just goes flying everywhere. Well, that's exactly what he did. And the water went flying also in his face. And so he's kind of blinded for a second there. And so he's just kind of like reaching around, keeping safe, you know, with the car, trying to find a rag that he had laid there. And as, as he's reaching around, all of a sudden someone says, here, it's right here. And he hands him the rag. And so he takes the rag and he cleans his face and so forth. And all of a sudden he looked and there was no one there. And he really thinks that it was an angel. I don't know. It's just the story he told me. But he thought it was so strange that someone handed him the rag and said, it's right here. And then all of a sudden they were not there. It wasn't enough time to get in his car, to drive away and get out back onto the freeway and so forth. You just never know. You never know uh, where God will send an angel to protect you. The Bible does say that, that an angel is signed to all of his children and that he protects us. So it could be that you may run into an angel run one day. Maybe when you give a homeless man food, it's really an angel and the Lord's testing us. And so that's why Paul said, entertain angels or strangers. You know, you just never know what God is going to do. Notice that they ate also again. They ate, literally ate under the tree, which speaks of that fellowship that we were talking about earlier. It's beautiful to fellowship with the Lord. And it's only at the tree of the cross, right, that we have fellowship with, with God himself because of what God did on the cross. So now we come to verse 9 through 15, as Sarah laughs. And the angel of the Lord said to Abraham, Where is Sarah, your wife? And Abraham said, Here, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. In other words, according to the earthly time, this now and then. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Uh, she was listening from that compartment probably in the tent there, which was behind him. And Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself. Now why did she laugh? Why did she laugh? Was it a laugh of, of there's no way that's going to happen? I'm just way beyond that. Uh, was it a laugh of, of um, I don't want this you know, situation? I know what a child uh, takes to be raised because my maidservant had Abraham's child you know, and so forth. Um, those type of things may have been going on through her mind. It took a while for the Lord to fulfill his promise here of her faith. Uh, could have been weakened by it. Who knows? Maybe that's the reason. Um, Sarah treated the announcement as incredible. Uh, she is old, and after I have grown old, she said, I shall, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being so old? And so she added this falsehood of distrust to the Lord himself. So we really don't know, the text doesn't say, but she laughed. And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, surely I, I surely, sh surely bear a child since I am old. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too uh, impossible for God? All things are possible for God. There, there's nothing that God can't do. Um, is it profitable? Maybe he shouldn't do it. But is it possible? Yeah, God can do anything. I, I like people with faith. Sometimes they're a little eccentric, you know, with their faith because they, they believe God for everything. And you're kind of like, okay, that's, I hope that happens, you know, and you know, I'll, I'll pray for you, but why not? Uh, Chuck Smith used to always say, I, I don't pray specifically for an item. 
I kind of pray for more than that because I want God to give it all. And someone recently said that I'm praying that God just give us everything. A friend of mine at the pastor's conference, he was sharing with me about their uh, their church up in Phelan. Uh, I'm praying that you'll you'll hear him on uh, August 7th. He's going to come down and hopefully share with you all. Good teacher. But uh, he said, bro, I just I just spoke with the owner of our property. They're like five acres or so. And I just went up to him. God just told me to go up to him and say, I want you to donate this property to the church. I'm like, you said that to him? He goes, yeah. I'm like, wow. You mean you literally, yeah, I just went up to him and I said, look, man, God wants you to donate this property to church. And then he told me, he says, well, I don't know about that. He goes, no, I want you to pray about it because I'm telling you that's what God told me. So I want you to go back and I just want you to pray about it. I'm thinking, wow, that takes a lot of faith. But that's what he did, you know. And sometimes people kind of trip me out when they do stuff like that. Like, I'm just praying that God do this and that. And I'm like, okay. And sometimes it happens, you're like, wow, Lord, I need faith like that. I need to believe, because all things are possible to the Lord. God can really do it if you have the faith. If you have the faith, there's nothing impossible. And he said, at the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah den- denied it, saying, I did not laugh. Verse 15, for she was afraid, and he said, no, but you did laugh. What a conversation that was. Now we come to the revelation and destruction of Sodom. Now we all know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's a very famous story. Uh, People that don't really read their Bible know the story how God rained judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah for their wickedness. And there's a lot of reasons that he did it. And it wasn't really because they were homosexual or their children were that wicked. It was because of unbelief when you really come right down to it. Unbelief in God. They wouldn't give their lives to the Lord. Whatever sin it was, it could have been a camp of alcoholics and God kept trying to minister to them and they just wouldn't give their lives to the Lord. He would have sent down the same judgment. But what a judgment that came down upon them. We, we kind of experienced that back in 1945 uh, where there was a day where people in their community, you know, men would ride their bicycles and go to work. Half, housewives would do their work in their house, sweep their floors and you know, fold their laundry. Children would uh, go off to school and be sitting in the classrooms and learning mathematics and, and other things while their moms were at home changing the diapers of, the, of their babies and so forth. And they knew nothing of what was about to happen when the United States sent a bomber over to them carrying instant death. And in a blink of an eye, the men on their bicycles, the women in their kitchens, the children in their classrooms were just engulfed in white hot flames, um, totally incinerated there in Hiroshima, gone because of uh, what had taken place. And it's gone down in the books of history as one of the worst nuclear um, or atom bombs ever to go off in uh, our world today besides Sodom and Gomorrah. And this was like the judgment of God on Sodom. <clears throat> and it will be the judgment on this earth one day. God is being gracious to us right now, but it seems like in these last days we're seeing evidence of God's judgment coming. <clears throat> in the days of Lot, Jesus said they were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. And on that day, Lot went out from Sodom and it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Luke seventeen twenty eight through 29. Just like in Hiroshima. No prophet to warn them. No message from an angel. No one to scream out in the newspapers. Just men, women, children of Sodom and Gomorrah were caught completely off guard. And their everlasting destruction came upon them. That is a sad commentary for them. And it's one for us. And I think that as we see things taking place today, more and more we're going to see more men standing up saying judgment is coming. And we're going to think it's odd because just like Sodom and Gomorrah, they had no idea that it was coming. They were oblivious to it. And just like Hiroshima, they thought nothing would happen. And so it's true today. We just think, oh, there's no way God's going to bring it now. They've been saying that for thousands of years. But why now? Why not now? Our world is corrupt. 
And so these men rose, verse 16, from there and looked toward Sodom and Abraham went with them and sent them on their way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? What an interesting thing for the Lord to say to Abraham or to think in his head, you know, am I going to hide this from Abraham, my servant? <clears throat> am I going to conceal this doom that's coming upon Sodom? his nephew Lot. I mean, that's the kind of relationship you want with the Lord, right? When he reveals things to you. When he shows you what's what's coming in the future. Um, and then you can trust in him when you speak about those things. I'm still waiting for a lot of things to happen in this church that the Lord has promised Virginia and I. <clears throat> and yet, uh, we keep hoping. And, and once in a while, I'll feel like, maybe so, Lord, but there are those times where I just kind of laugh, maybe not. Maybe it's not going to happen after all. Maybe in not my lifetime. Maybe in the next next lifetime that uh, someone takes over and, and something takes place. But either way, God is God is faithful and, and he gives you from time to time information you know, to equip you, to prepare you, uh, or just to let you know what's going on in your life and the lives of others. So we need to be in prayer and that's what happens when you're in prayer with the Lord. And so verse 18 says, Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, for I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abram what is his spoken, what he has spoken to him. Um, Abram here is a type of, of mediator where he will mediate between God and Lot and he will confront the Lord and cry out if he could have mercy on him look at verse 20 the Lord said because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grieved <clears throat> I will go down now and see whether they have done it all together according to the outcry against it that has come to me and if not I will know so apparently the wages of sin have grown to a point where God now is going to, to judge them. It will be like this in the last days. Jesus said that in Luke 17. It will be like the days of Lot, like Sodom and Gomorrah. And men will be crying out to God and judgment will come. Then the two men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood before the Lord, or Jehovah is the Hebrew word. And he spoke with God as a man would speak to a man um, to encourage him not to judge Sodom. Now, we know from what we've read so far that Abraham had just put his wife in a position of extreme, extreme compromise with Pharaoh. And the Lord delivered him. He got an illegitimate child by his wife's servant girl. He treated her badly by kicking them out of the camp. And in a real sense, when you think about it, Abraham's just as guilty as Sodom and Gomorrah are. And yet, Abraham the sinner had been forgiven by God again and again and again. And I believe that it's because he has a repentant heart, just like David. And he knew that God would forgive him, offering up the sacrifices. As he came out of camp, right there again, built an altar and offered up a sacrifice. And we saw that in Genesis. When you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, there was no hearts of repentance. And so that is the difference between the two. How would you respond to the news of maybe a neighbor heading to destruction? How would you handle that? You know, there was this Orlando thing that took place in that nightclub. And that gunman went in and just shot all these people up. And I heard there was remarks from the church, Christian church. Good. That's what they deserve. Yeah. <clears throat> and that might be so. I mean, I don't know God, but why would you say that? Every life is valuable to the Lord. 
Lord loves everyone. That's why he died for everyone. And that's a shame that they had to go that way and they didn't have more opportunity. And I'm sure that there were Christians in there that were struggling with homosexual um, tendencies that are now in the presence of the Lord. And that's God's grace. And he has a plan for it all. But, you know, how should we react? We need grace. We need love. As Brian called it, he called it radical grace. There's, there's a book called Radical Prayer, Radical Living. We need, we need that in the last days. We need to live radically for the Lord. But Abraham came near, verse 23, <clears throat> and he basically is going to ask God, is this fair? <laughs> Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked Lord? Notice that um, there is no difference between the righteous and the wicked here. In a, in a sense, uh, he asked for both. Would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? Uh, we'll find that Abraham will plead with God that he might spare the whole city. Yes, he pleaded primarily for the whole city that God would spare them also in their homosexuality. Suppose, verse 24, suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place? You see, he's pleading for the place, not just for Lot. And not spare it? for the 50 righteous that were there. Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the, the judge of all the earth do right? So the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I'll spare all the place for their sake. The neighbor answered and said, indeed now, I who am but dust... And ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. You, you see how he's speaking to God? That's how we should speak to God. You know, when we're pleading for something, and, and I'm, not, I'm not talking about a, a superficial prayer, but real life issues, you know, jobs and relationships and children and those things. Life itself, Lord, what do you, what do you want me to do in life? You ought to be pleading, Lord, Lord, would you just talk to me? Would you just show me? Lord, I know I'm nothing. I'm just dust. I'm just a, a man among many other... I talk to the Lord like this all, Among many other men. Why would you bless me? There's no reason at all for you to do that. As Moses said, you, you bless who you want and you'll curse who you want. You're God. But Lord, could you? Could you just come down and bless us? Could you just come down and hear our prayers? You know, and he's like pleading with them, his case. Uh, and God hears that. You see it here, where God is listening to him. And, and he's kind of saying, okay, so if I find 50, all right, and I'll spare the whole place. But then he says, that's not enough. Suppose there were five less than the 50, verse 28. Would you destroy all the city for f the lack of five? So he said, if I find there 45, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again and said, suppose there be 40 found there. And he said, I will not do it for the sake of 40. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry now. <laughs> at this point, he's like, I feel like I'm pushing you a little bit here. No, not at all. And I will speak, suppose 30 should be found there. So he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, indeed, now, I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. I'd love to see this text in the Hebrew and, and really see what kind of Jewish argument he has for the Lord and, and, and the tenses of how he's doing it too. Verse 32, so he said, to the, said again, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak but once more, just one more time, suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. But God didn't stop at 10. He, he could have stopped at 10, but he didn't stop at 10 because as we see, there were only so many in the household of Lot, roughly around four. And God spared at least the four that came out of Sodom and Gomorrah. So the Lord went his way and as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Now Sodom and Gomorrah is a picture of the world. It's a type of our world and the world that we live in. A world that is permeated with sin. A world that disbelieves in a God. A world that is 
contrary to Christianity and to God's word. And it's a world that lives without a God, just like our world. Doing their own things, seeking after their own pleasures, having their own ways. That is not Christianity by far. John is so clear, we are not to love the world. How can you not understand that? And I'm not talking to you, but I'm talking to the world. How can you not understand that as a Christian? You're not to be like the world. Plain and simple. And yet people continue to try to be exactly like the world. That's the world. And Sodom is a picture of that world. Lot is the picture of the church living in the world. And we're to live like Lot. Now I know Lot gets a bad rep because we think Lot enjoyed that, but he didn't. Peter made it very clear that Lot was righteous and he became a judge there. And he was dealing with the people. He was among them, distributing grace and love to the people. And that's what the church is supposed to do. Yes, we're among the people, as Paul says. We're in the world, but we're not to be a part of the world. Yeah, we have to live here. And we're to live here, as Jesus said, light and salt. We're to reflect him And the more that we spend time with him, the more that we reflect him to this lost and dying world. But if we're in love with the world, how can you reflect Christ to that world? Because you're trying to be just like the world. And what happens is is you don't love the world enough to try to change the world. So you join the world and you become like the world. And you're hanging around the popular people and the beautiful people and doing the nice and beautiful things. But the whole time they're going to hell in a handbasket because you've said nothing. you said nothing. Why? Because you want to be like them. You want to be popular. You want to be beautiful. You want to have all those things that the world has. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have those things for our households. Because you see many of ministers having a lot of beautiful things. But it's for the glory of God. We need to understand that, that separation of the world and of the church itself. And then Abraham is a picture of Christ. He's a picture of Christ. He intercedes. He prays for the church. Uh, He sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us all the time. This is also a picture of the rapture. We see judgment coming upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And this judgment is coming from God. Coming from God. Just like in Noah... God sent the flood. God is bringing judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. And then we see in the New Testament, in Revelation, that God will bring judgment on the world. When God brings judgment, he always rescues his people from that judgment. So when you saw the flood, who did he take out of the flood first? Enoch. Because it says Enoch walked with God, and then he was not. He was taken up. Noah is a type of Israel going through the tribulation. So Enoch was taken up. God's judgment is coming on Sodom and Gomorrah. Who does he take out? Lot. He takes out Lot and his family. Pulls them out before judgment comes on the world. But of course, there's always casualties. We'll see later on that Lot's wife hungered for the world so much she turns around and looks back at the world. And so she dies in that judgment also. So it's the type of the rapture, and so it's true today. I believe in pre-tribulation that God will remove the church first before God's wrath comes upon the world. So during that first three and a half years where prosperity will come to this world, who knows, Trump may bring that prosperity to the whole world. I don't know. This may may lead to a one-world government, but they definitely have all of you. How many of you have smartphones and you have that that thumbprint identification? You know, you have that? Well, guess what? They've got your thumbprint now on file. Facebook has it right there. Apple has it. And government, you know government. They can just take any information that they want. So most of the world is now on record. They have computers now that that can um, track you. I can track you. If you don't know how to use your phone, I can actually look you up if you're on Facebook or something else. I can know exactly where you're at. It will locate where you're at. I remember one time I was at a conference and a guy calls me up and says, Hey man, I'm in Temecula. I I see you're there too. I'm like, 
dude, how did you know I was here? He goes, oh, your phone. I'm like, what? So I, he showed me how to do it. I'm like, that's crazy. That, that the government now, can, that's one world government. That's control. It's all leading to this. And of course, God is going to rapture out his, his people first before that judgment comes. So, But you need to know Jesus Christ. You can't be like Lot's wife and turn back and look at this world. You have to cut yourself from this world and you have to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Give your lives to the Lord. Completely surrender to Him. Whatever His will is for your life. His will for your life is more important than any other thing in your life. In your life. It's more important than any relationship you may think you want or think that you should have. That relationship with Him is far more important than that. His, your relationship with Him is more important than any schooling, any education, any business, any... Um, idea at all his will is more important than that because he has a perfect will for you and that perfect will 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 take you down a path of peace and rest and joy and prosperity as God desires to give each one of us something different in the body of Christ and for his glory the struggle is is that we want our will to be done we want to do it our way it doesn't work out that way. It's not what God wants. And we kick against it. I know I've kicked against it many times and he brings us right back to that place where he says, okay, now have you surrendered? Yes, whatever you want, Lord, I'm going to trust in you because you know what's best. He's God. He knows past, present, and future. He sits on the throne and intercedes for us. He knows exactly what we need and we need to trust him. Abraham had grace grace poured upon him Sarah had grace poured upon him Lot had amazing grace poured upon him as judgment was coming that's how we should walk in this world with God's grace and asking and pleading God to have grace on us every day as we walk for him